I think it's painfully obvious why ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses aren't allowed to see this material. But again, it's worth stressing that they should have access to this material. Why do you have this whole series of rules and policies and provisions that ordinary members know nothing about? It's, again, just flabbergasting that you have a religion that calls itself the truth, but there's one truth for the rank and file, and there's another truth, or awkward truth, for the elders and for the circuit overseers. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic and welcome to Volume 2 of Awkward Truth, the series in which I review leaked videos that ordinary rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses aren't supposed to see in my efforts to explain and reveal the real truth behind the Jehovah's Witness organization. Today's video, or series of videos that I'm going to be reviewing, has been leaked by, as far as I know, by a Reddit user, or at least involving a Reddit user named Dav underscore King. The videos that we're going to be looking at today are training materials apparently intended for training circuit overseers. So circuit overseers are special elders that answer directly to the organization or to the local branch. They are allocated a number of congregations that they need to visit over a period of, I think, two years. So they basically rotate around these different congregations and visit them and make sure that the congregation is towing the line and doing everything according to the instructions set forth by the organization. This, I can assure you, is an authentic video, training video that's been produced by Jehovah's Witnesses to help circuit overseers understand their role in a particular situation involving pornography, <laughs> spoiler alert, as was the case in volume one of this series. So involving pornography, where an elder's qualifications or an elder's position as an elder is brought into question by the act of viewing pornography. So, <laughs> as you can imagine, it's going to be entertaining in a weird, twisted sort of way. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Before we take our next door, may I talk to you about something that's been bothering me? Sure. You know, since I'm a new elder, I've been giving a lot of thought about whether I should speak up and tell you about something that recently happened on our body. I know you met with the coordinator on Tuesday before the meeting. Uh, perhaps he shared with you that he recently confessed to viewing non-important pornography? No, he didn't tell me. We reviewed his qualifications, but it was decided to retain him as an elder. When did the body meet to review his qualifications? Brother Martin, we met about a month ago. We met for almost four hours, and the body was divided. A lot of strong opinions were shared. The majority felt that because he voluntarily confessed that he's still qualified to serve. But I think everyone just got tired and ultimately allowed him to continue serving. Was this a one-time occurrence, or was this a practice? This was not a one-time occurrence. He viewed pornography multiple times over a year. To your knowledge, has the body ever given him counsel on this matter before? I don't know if he's ever received counsel before in the past. But you know, you mentioned to me in your last visit that no matter how large or small the issue, to always consult the Bible, the Shepherd Book, and research publications. So I was a bit surprised that in that meeting, we never opened up the Bible to read a scripture or read the chapter on pornography in the Shepherd Book. We should have asked the questions in that chapter and, and we didn't. I really regret not speaking up about it. 
but I must admit I did feel quite out intimidated and outnumbered. Well, Brother Wilson, thank you for bringing this to my attention. I appreciate that. What should I do? Should I continue to question this newly appointed elder for more information? Or should I speak to the coordinator? If I decide to speak to the coordinator, should I do it alone or have another elder with me? Is this really a matter for the entire body to meet on? And since the body has decided, is this a closed matter? Should I simply have that newly appointed elder respect the decision of the body and move on? How to proceed? I think I need to take this to Jehovah in prayer. So that was the first segment in this series. We've just seen a conversation between a newly appointed elder and a circuit overseer. Apparently they're supposed to be in the preaching work, which is odd because they're in a classroom. <laughs> so they haven't really... This isn't a big budget production, you know. They're just asking us to kind of imagine them being in a preaching setting. And this young elder approaches the circuit overseer during the circuit overseer's visit to express or confide in him about this situation involving pornography where he feels that he was, quote, intimidated and outnumbered. I could relate to that because I spent a year as a newly appointed elder and I have to say the the whole kind of politics of being an elder took me completely by surprise and the way there really is a pecking order on a body of elders and the ones who are newly appointed are treated kind of like second class elders and it is very, very easy to be intimidated into going along with something just to keep everybody else happy, which surely shouldn't be the case, but it clearly is the case because they even allude to that scenario right off the bat in this series. They also allude to the Shepherd book, a copy of which I have here, and I will be referring to it as we proceed. So there's the the book Shepherd, the Flock of God. And this is really the book that defines the way elders should go about being elders. And the problem I've always had with this publication, I shouldn't have this, by the way, this was smuggled to me <laughs> from inside the organization, the problem I've always had with this publication is why isn't it available to all Jehovah's Witnesses? How can you have a rule book that impacts on the lives of not just elders but everyone in a congregation by explaining how elders are to treat people in a congregation and how can you have it so that only elders have access to all of these rules and all of these procedures? You don't have any precedent for that whatsoever in the Bible. In the Bible, if there were any rules that the people or the Israelites or God's worshippers needed to hear, they would just announce them to everybody. Everyone was on the same page in understanding what the rules were and what the consequences would be for breaking the rules and what the procedures would be for administering justice. But Jehovah's Witnesses have this completely non-biblical way of adjudicating various situations whereby there are these secret rules that only elders or only people high up in the organization know about and the ordinary rank and file are frankly in the dark. Amen. Brother Johnson, thank you for taking the time to get with me and for your years of faithful service. I've asked Brother Williams to join us. It's come to my attention in speaking with Brother Williams and Brother Wilson on your body 
that you've had a problem viewing pornography many times over the past year. Is that true? You know, Brother, Brother Martin, this is something that uh, deeply ashamed of and, and embarrassed about the whole situation. You know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, having been introduced to pornography as a, as a young person, it's been a struggle. Um, but learning the truth, I was able to, to leave it behind, you know. But uh, in the last couple of years, uh, things at home, it's been a challenge. My wife has, has entered menopause and uh, intimacy in our marriage has been affected. And uh, due to that, it's led me to, to viewing pornography. And of course, it's, it's not an excuse but uh, I, I view heterosexual non-abhorrent pornography too, just to let you brothers know that. But like I said, it's no excuse for my behavior, but that's, that's the situation. It was quite interesting towards the end there when Brother Johnson stresses that his viewing of pornography was only of non-abhorrent pornography. As I explained in the previous installment of this series, Jehovah's Witnesses have two different forms of pornography and basically what it boils down to is, is it heterosexual, in other words, non-abhorrent, or is it homosexual and involving other things that Jehovah's Witnesses would find disgusting, in which case it's abhorrent and if it's abhorrent, then there would be no conversation about any possibility of Brother Johnson continuing as an elder because it would be a straightforward disfellowshipping uh, matter or something where they would have to meet with him judicially. But because it's non-abhorrent, in their words, because it's heterosexual, according to him, the pornography that he's been watching, in many cases elders and ministerial servants or ordinary rank and file members can get off <laughs> can get away with um just a slapped wrist pun unintentional there it, it's just kind of a slapped wrist situation um so that's i think an important point to discuss and also it was interesting to see the excuses he was making while saying, well, these aren't excuses, of course, but really they were the way in which he was explaining his past as though that makes the viewing of pornography more likely the fact that he wasn't raised as a Jehovah's Witness. I would argue that it makes no difference at all whether you're raised as a Jehovah's Witness or raised outside of the organization pornography is something that's freely accessible it's not like it's a secret <laughs> that, that pornography exists and is accessible on the internet so it was a little bit of a dig really at non-jehovah's witnesses at so-called worldly people because they're apparently the source of all this he also blames it on his wife entering menopause and Obviously, all of this is, is fictional, but it is interesting to consider that Brother Johnson, as a coordinator, would be experienced enough as an elder that he would have presided over perhaps dozens of judicial committee cases where he's hearing other people's confessions over sexual matters, including the viewing of pornography. And he, he's been trained to be dismissive of people if they start trying to make excuses for themselves and start trying to blame it on other things. And yet that's immediately the route that he's taking when he's the one whose behaviour is under scrutiny. Does your wife know anything about this? No, no, she'd be crushed. Um, so I hadn't told her about it. Uh, but... You know, my conscience started bothering me on this situation, and so I wanted to 
bring it up to the brothers and get the matter handled. And since you met with the brothers, have there been any, any additional episodes viewing pornography? Yeah, this is uh, it's embarrassing. I'm ashamed to answer that question, Brother Martin, but yes. There's been a couple of times that uh, since informing the brothers that I have viewed it. Please understand that we're both here. We're to assist you. And Garland, we appreciate being able to speak with you openly and honestly. That takes courage. And we want Jehovah's help, but to get it, we have to follow theocratic direction as outlined for us in the Shepherd Book. I thought it would be good if we read a piece of that, okay? Let's go to chapter 13, if you would. I'm going to read paragraph 6. Now, let me review with you what it says here in the first three points that are made. There's more, but we'll just take the first three, okay? The body of elders may determine that the person still qualifies to serve in an appointed position if, one, his involvement consisted of a few brief viewings of non-abhorrent forms of pornography. Two, he displays a heartfelt desire to desist from looking at pornography. And three, the elders are convinced that he will refrain from viewing it. Now, I know that the elders met with you, they reviewed your qualifications, but since this matter really is more than a few brief viewings, and since there's been recent relapses, we're going to need to look at your qualifications all over again Friday night at the elders' meeting. Wow. I didn't, I didn't expect that, especially considering the fact that we, we've already went through the whole process. But I'm willing to cooperate if, to set matters straight. I have no problem with it. Garland, let me reassure you that the review of these things is being done with your best interest at heart and that of your dear wife. Let's, let's offer a prayer to Jehovah, shall we? Sure. It really is remarkable footage, this, isn't it? It's worth remembering that what we're talking about here is looking at porn and yet they're treating it as though someone's died or been killed or <laughs> like there's been some kind of committing of fraud or theft or something. But this is the reality, of course, of the Jehovah's Witness religion. And it's kind of hard to feel sorry for Brother Johnson, given the fact that, again, as an elder who's been around enough to be the coordinator of the body of elders, he has been involved in judging so many people over the course of his service as an elder. They are making a huge deal out of this, as indeed the Shepherd Book makes a huge deal out of pornography. I mentioned, I think, in the last video that pornography gets an entire chapter in the Shepherd Book, whereas the crime of stealing gets a couple of sentences <laughs> in the advice on the rules for disfellowshipping. So it's really, in my opinion, quite a messed up book. But since they're referring to the Shepherd Book, I'm going to also refer to the Shepherd Book, and I'm going to draw your attention to chapter 8 paragraph 25 because you'll notice when brother johnson is confessing to viewing porn and indeed viewing porn even since his qualifications were reviewed he said quote my conscience started bothering me so it's basically purely because of his conscience that this whole thing is being discussed to begin with. If he'd just viewed pornography in private and not talked to anybody about it, none of this would be happening. And what I find troubling is that if you are the sort of elder who doesn't have a conscience, 
if you are the sort of elder who is a total hypocrite and is quite happy to judge other people while not holding to the rules yourself, you can actually just fly under the radar and advance up the organizational ladder and do very well in the organization. This is an organization where the rules favor dishonesty and favor elders not having a conscience. And to prove it, I'm going to show you, um, again, chapter 8, paragraph 25. This is in my copy of the Shepherd book, which is a slightly older printed version from 2020, but I have checked, and the exact same wording is in the current Shepherd book because they're changing it all the time. Let's look at paragraph 25 in chapter 8. And this, by the way, is under the main heading situations that require a review of an appointed brother's qualifications. Point 25, committed a disfellowshipping offence years in the past and the matter was never addressed. So it's talking about a disfellowshipping offence. Obviously, viewing non-abhorrent pornography isn't a disfellowshipping offence, but the same principle applies. The body of elders may determine he can continue to serve if the following is true. The immorality or other serious wrongdoing occurred more than a few years ago, and he is genuinely repentant, recognizing that he should have come forward immediately when he sinned. Perhaps he has even confessed to his sin, seeking help with his guilty conscience. He has been serving faithfully for many years, has evidence of God's blessing, and has the respect of the congregation. So what it's saying there is, you can even commit a disfellowshipping offence as an elder. And as long as you keep quiet about it and allow many years to pass, if it ever comes to light, you've got to get out of jail free card right there in the shepherd book. I call it the don't ask, don't tell rule <laughs> because that's essentially what it is. Keep your wrongdoing to yourself, allow enough years to pass, and you can just carry on. The same section under paragraph 27 says, if the wrongdoing occurred within the past few years while he was serving as an elder or a ministerial servant, he is disqualified from serving as such, not being free from accusation. Depending on the circumstances, the situation may also need to be handled by a judicial committee. But again, the onus is on within the past few years. So if you do something wrong as an elder, provided you stop doing it and enough time goes by, you are essentially immune from being removed as an elder according to that provision. Again, this is a provision that gives an advantage to elders who are dishonest and hypocritical. Brothers, I want you to know that Brother Wilson brought to my attention the ongoing problem Brother Johnson is having with viewing pornography. Now, I understand that you met with him reviewed his qualifications, and you decided to retain him. I However, can't believe you did that. You had no right to take this outside the body at this time. The body of elders met, and they rendered a decision with this situation. As far as we're concerned, the matter's closed. There's no need to discuss it further. You broke confidentiality. In fact, we may have to review your qualifications. Well, brothers, the reason why I spoke to Brother Martin is because we didn't follow the procedures in the Shepherd Book. Brothers, I know this isn't easy for you. It's not easy for Brother Johnson either. But to continue, let me remind you, please, of the responsibility that we all have to maintain good order 
so that our elders' meetings are conducted decently and by arrangement. Jesus said at Matthew 18, 20, that where two or three were gathered, that he would be in their midst. Therefore, to maintain respect for Jesus' presence, if you want to comment, please raise your hand. This was interesting for two reasons. Firstly, you'll remember right at the beginning of this series of segments, we learned that this younger elder had felt intimidated and outnumbered. And now we're getting a glimpse of how that can be when elders meet together. All it takes is for one I call them bully elders, but let's say one elder who is very, very assertive and who just insists on his way of doing things or his opinion. All it takes is for you to have one such character on a body of elders and very, very quickly the entire body can just get swept along with doing whatever that person wants that particular elder to do. And for them to reenact this in a training video for circuit overseers indicates that this is common. This is just a common thing among elders. You would think it would be an absolute no-no for someone to speak so forcefully and assertively and without really showing any kind of respect for decorum. You would think straight away it would be a case of, well, what are you doing? Should you really be an elder if that's the attitude that you display during elders' meetings? But it's just taken for granted that that's how some elders are. So that was interesting. And I also found it interesting that an issue gets raised about confidentiality. So this younger elder is told, you broke confidentiality by going to the circuit overseer, which according to the organization's own rules and policies is not the case. According to the organization, there isn't really such thing as confidentiality when it comes to elders talking among themselves and conferring with circuit overseers. Basically, anything goes. And what's interesting is when this guy speaks out and vents and rants on this issue, the circuit overseer doesn't deal with the specific objection itself he raises the technicality of the guy not raising his hand first before giving his comment. He completely ignores, and we're going to see this, he completely ignores the entire issue of confidentiality that got raised. And just to put this in context, I'm going to refer you to episode 25 of JW Watch, which was then called Watchtower in Focus. This was a really interesting and, I think, important episode that we recorded because it dealt with an instance where Jehovah's Witnesses appealed to the United States Supreme Court on the issue of confidentiality, particularly the clergy penitent privilege provision in United States law that allows Catholic priests to receive confessions, even regarding criminal behaviour, and not then disclose this confession to the authorities. And Jehovah's Witnesses essentially went to the Supreme Court and said, hang on a minute, you're letting the Catholics get away with this. Why can't we have similar secrecy? Why can't we have the ability to keep our records secret when we learn that someone has committed a crime. I actually don't think there's any excuse for concealing crime, whether it's the Catholic Church and one priest, or Jehovah's Witnesses and dozens of elders all learning about a crime being committed. The point is, Jehovah's Witnesses do have a very flexible attitude when it comes to keeping confidentiality in situations where someone confesses to wrongdoing. So it was very interesting that this elder raised this particular objection 
and essentially nothing was said in return. Now, brothers, could you go with me, please, to chapter one of the Shepherd Book? It reminds us of the following. It says, older elders should not take offense when younger elders give suggestions or respectfully offer counsel. So I want to commend Brother Wilson for bringing this to my attention. But as a matter of fact, brothers, let's go a little bit further. The Shepherd Book on chapter 13. Paragraph 1 makes a, some powerful points here. I'll read it to you. It says, Helping a Christian break free from the habit of viewing pornography requires scriptural counsel by loving shepherds. Therefore, when an elder learns that a Christian has deliberately viewed pornography, the body of elders should assign two elders to meet with him to establish the facts and determine the extent of the problem. If he's married, he should be kindly encouraged to reveal this matter to his mate. After the initial investigation, the assigned elders should provide an update to the body of elders. Therefore, brothers, I want to commend all of you. It's the responsibility of the body to evaluate whether or not the qualifications are being met by the coordinator to continue to serve. However, after meeting with Brother Johnson and Brother Williams, it became clear to me in looking at printed direction as well that the decision of the body of elders needs to be revisited. I'm sorry, Brother Martin, but I object to this. We feel as a body that we've already put Brother Johnson through enough pain and anguish during this last review of his qualifications. Now, I'm going to tell you straight. Our entire body of elders, we understand Garland's predicament. In fact, we discussed the problem that he and his wife have been experiencing. We feel that he'll be able to handle the situation from here on and therefore is not disqualified from serving. And brothers, how many of you agree with the sentiments just expressed? I think it's painfully obvious why ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses aren't allowed to see this material. But again, it's worth stressing that they should have access to this material. Why do you have this whole series of rules and policies and provisions that ordinary members know nothing about. It's, again, just flabbergasting that you have a religion that calls itself the truth, but there's one truth for the rank and file, and there's another truth or awkward truth for the elders and for the circuit overseers. Again, I just can't help but focus in on the behavior of this older elder who is trying to intimidate the other elders and trying to essentially railroad the conversation. It's, for me, an admission that this culture exists on body of elders, that this sort of behavior is normal. And it was also ironic that this guy referred to the pain and anguish that they had already caused Brother Johnson, not in any judicial committee or committee of elders, as it's now called, not in deciding on whether he gets to remain as a Jehovah's Witness or have relationships with his believing family members, but purely in discussing whether he should continue as an elder. And that was a source of pain and anguish for Brother Johnson. Where's the acknowledgement for all of the pain, the anguish, the trauma that they inflict on ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses in dragging them before committees of elders to deliberate over their personal lives and in many cases reach judgments that result in them being estranged from everybody they know and love. Well, brothers, since you reached the decision on this matter, can you share with me, please, the Bible principles that you used or the theocratic references that you went to so as to come to such a conclusion? Brothers, are you aware that when we met with Brother Johnson earlier in the week, 
that he confessed to ongoing viewing of pornography since the time you reviewed his qualifications? Is that right, Brother Johnson? Brothers, you aware of that? Well, to assist us in really viewing this matter properly, let's look at a couple of scriptures together, okay? Please, let's go to Matthew 5. And I want you to notice, please, Jesus' words at verse 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks, keeps on looking at a woman so as to have a passion for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Go to Paul's words, please, at Colossians chapter 3. Look, please, at verse 5. Deaden, therefore, your body members that are on the earth as respect sexual immorality, uncleanness, uncontrolled sexual passion, hurtful desire, and greediness, which is idolatry. Now, brothers, when you review those scriptures, what does this help us understand about Brother Johnson's conduct? And no doubt you agree that what he's confessed to is a clear violation of those two scriptural principles. And as loyal men, aren't we concerned with more than just our personal opinions on these matters? Don't we want to get Jehovah's viewpoint, his will, as we proceed? So it's all about getting Jehovah's viewpoint, apparently. I would argue that it's not really so much about Jehovah's viewpoint, it's about the organization's viewpoint. Because not everything that the organization teaches, not every policy that they have or rule they have, has a basis in scripture. Perfect example is the beard rule <laughs> that only recently got reversed. There was no Bible verse propping that up. There was never any real justification for it. It was all really a, a case of personal preference among the leadership. They didn't want people having beards, and so no one was allowed to have beards. When it comes to porn, and I realize this is a controversial subject, it's a very nuanced subject, isn't it? Because there is so much potential for people to be exploited in the porn industry. And that's clearly disgusting that that happens. There's never an excuse for people to be exploited and used and abused in that way. But it's also possible that people willingly participate in the porn industry, that they find it useful for them as a means of making money and they don't have a problem with being involved in the porn industry. So it's a nuanced subject and I understand there will be different opinions when it comes to the rightness or wrongness of pornography. But let's get one thing straight. The Bible is silent on pornography. There are no verses dealing with pornography and it's not like they didn't have porn back in the first century or back in Bible times. It's very, very clear when you look at the archaeological evidence that people were depicting genitals and sexual acts every which way. So it's not like the Bible writers knew nothing about pornography. They had an opportunity to condemn something that was widespread at that time and they didn't condemn it. So I object to the premise or the claim that the Bible is against pornography because, again, there isn't a single verse. One of the verses that gets read is Matthew 5, verse 28, where Jesus talks about everyone who keeps on looking at a woman so as to have a passion for her has already committed adultery in his heart. If you think about it, that's actually quite a messed up thing to say because that's thought crime, you know? We all should be accountable for our actions, 
that's something where we all need to take responsibility and we all need to conduct ourselves in an appropriate manner towards other people when it comes to what we actually do or say. But when it comes to what's going through our heads, what this verse is essentially saying is, if you see a woman who you find attractive, you have no control over whether you find a woman attractive. If you see her and you're attracted, and you shouldn't be, you can't then go on looking at her so as to feel a passion. So what are you supposed to do? Just like, I can't look at that woman. I can't look at that woman. I don't want to feel a passion. It's just silly. Our brains are going to do, quite frankly, whatever our brains were going to do according to our brain chemistry. We don't have control over what we're thinking. We do have control over how we act. So I think the Bible verse, or that particular Bible verse, not only does it not condemn pornography, it can't because there are no Bible verses condemning pornography, but number two, and this is just my observation, you can agree or disagree, I think it's very problematic from the point of view of dictating what people are allowed to think or not think, which when you think about it is very disturbing and Orwellian. So brothers, Let's look at what the organization says about someone who's appointed who continues to view pornography. It's here again in the Shepherd book. Let's go now to paragraph 6 of chapter 13. It says, On the other hand, a Christian who persists in viewing non-abhorrent forms of pornography cannot be considered exemplary and thus does not qualify for special privileges in the congregation. So, brothers, do you understand in view of Brother Johnson's confession why we need to review his qualifications again? So, to help us meet the understanding of what the criteria is for him to continue to serve, we go back to very specific information in the Shepherd Book. Paragraph 5 now of chapter 13 has questions that need to be considered. Now, did the body of elders get the answers to these questions when you reviewed his qualifications the last time? Brother Wilson? No, he didn't. And honestly, I didn't speak up about it at the time. Well, brothers, we need to get the answers to these questions, and we need to do it now. But let me ask you something, and you can give me your frank response on this too. Why didn't you consider these questions with him before? Brother Martin, I'm very sorry for going off like that. Frankly, this has been very hard and it was really hard the last time, emotionally that is. Garland is a very good friend. No, he's more like a son to me. I think my feelings got in the way and had more to do with the way I made the decision than the book did. That can happen to any of us. But to continue to have Jehovah's blessing on Garland, and really on your body, the whole congregation, we need to follow Bible-based guidance provided by the slave. And it's a way to show loyalty to our king as well. So do you brothers understand why we need now to review his qualifications? Do you all agree to proceed? All right. I find it interesting that there are zero repercussions for this body of elders completely going about things the wrong way the first time. So this circuit overseer asks the question, why didn't you go through these questions the first time? And the guy who keeps mouthing off relents and apologizes and he says, my feelings got in the way, which I think is sort of an answer to the question. Oh, we didn't go through all of these questions with Brother Johnson the first time because of favoritism. Because he's one of us. He's one of the lads. So different rules apply. And we 
allowed our fondness for him, because he's one of our mates, we allowed that to affect our judgment and not put him through the same amount of scrutiny that we would put an ordinary member of the congregation through. Different rules apply. Sorry, it was favoritism. And rather than the body of elders facing any kind of repercussions for this, any kind of punishment, or I don't know how you would punish it, but rather than trying to address that quite serious double standard that they're giving an elder a free pass, but being super, super invasive with ordinary members of the congregation when they screw up, Rather than deal with that, it's just a case of, oh, everybody does that. What does the circuit overseer say? That can happen to any of us. Anyway, we figured it out eventually. Let's now go through the process. So it's just an open admission again. First of all, we had the admission that you can have these very intimidating bully elders on bodies of elders who kind of railroad the discussion and get people to agree to their way of doing things. And now we're having an admission that there can be favoritism on a body of elders. And when there is favoritism and people don't do things by the book, there is zero consequences. Let's go back again to the shepherd book. You'll notice chapter 13, paragraph 6. There's five points there, brothers. Now, these are the questions that you need to consider as you go forward reviewing Brother Johnson's qualifications. These are the things you may need more information on as a body to make a good decision. So, let's review the procedure, all right? Please open to chapter 8 now of the Shepherd Book. Look at paragraph 32, please. Let's follow along. We're going to read it together. Brother Wilson, would you do that for us, please? It says, If it is necessary to review an elder's qualifications, the body of elders should consider the matter with the brother in question present using the following procedure. Number one, after seeking Jehovah's guidance in prayer, make sure all the facts are presented. Maintain a respectful, orderly atmosphere that is conducive to such a discussion. Number two, allow the brother adequate time to express his feelings and to answer any questions. Ask him for his view of the matters being discussed regarding his qualifications. Number three, ask the brother to leave the room while the other elders continue their discussion and decide what, what, what they will recommend. Number four, invite the brother back into the room. If the decision is to recommend his deletion, inform him of this and the scriptural reasons. Number five, give the brother opportunity to comment on the decision. It may be necessary for the brother to leave the room again so that the elders can discuss the matter further before making a final decision. Thank you. Now we understand the procedure we need to follow to review Brother Johnson's qualifications. Brother Johnson, I want to reassure you that as we follow these points of review, it'll give us the opportunity for a fair, balanced, theocratic review of your qualifications. And you can clearly see that these brothers have what's best in mind for the body, for you, for the congregation. They clearly have a deep love for you and your wife. We need to get to Jehovah's guidance though, brothers. Brother Wilson, would you do that for us, please? And we'll just let it run all the way to the copyright mark, just again to establish <laughs> that this is a legitimate Jehovah's Witness official video, albeit one that is being kept secret from the rank and file. Only circuit overseers are allowed to watch this as part of their training. So I would suggest that Brother Johnson is not going to be an elder for much longer <laughs> because according to everything they've highlighted from the Shepherd book, again, which ordinary rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses aren't allowed to read, according to what they've already read, it's clear that he has to be deleted as an elder. But this is obviously to train circuit overseers on how to deal with 
what must be a common scenario where the procedures aren't followed and favoritism does kick in and there is feuding on the body of elders and there is intimidation and as a result procedures don't get followed properly that's the whole reason why this video has been produced to begin with and i think that says a lot about the organization the fact that this video should even be necessary and if it is necessary again why are they ashamed of it or why can't this be something that all jehovah's witnesses are free to watch even if it's with the proper context of, oh, this is how we train our circuit overseers. Why can't they have transparency? So I hope you found my comments, my review of this video helpful. There will be further installments in the Awkward Truth series, and you can watch those by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for watching.